Hello, and welcome to the Six Five Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners here at Futurum Research. And on behalf of my team at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We're glad to have you here. In this spotlight session, Futurum's Daniel Newman is joined by Austin Russell, the founder and CEO of Luminar. Their conversation today covers the big themes of autonomous vehicles and LIDAR and what's in store for this emerging technology over the coming decade. If you drive a car, chances are good, this is a conversation you'll want to hear. Let's go have a listen. Austin Russell, welcome to the 6-5 Summit. So excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to chat. Um, sometimes we are able to do it here on video, and sometimes we randomly run into each other at F1 in Austin. But every time we've had the chance to have a conversation, I've always really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of thoughts on a lot of things, and I'm hope hoping I'm going to use this time to get some of them out there for all the listeners at our event this year. Um, you know, I want to talk well, to you. Are we going to run into each other at the F1 in Florida? I'm not. I'm uh, not. And I'm really disappointed about it. Um, I overbooked myself. I'm going to be in Florida, but not for for the F1. I do intend to do Vegas, and I do intend to do Monaco this year, and I'll definitely see you in Austin Mr. Yeah, Austin. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although we do get to be with the Mercedes team and uh and not it's actually not too far from our office in the Charleston, Florida, there too, for the uh for the F1, which is kind of kind of interesting. But yeah, uh, I'm, obviously I'm, a little I'm, different than the passenger car uh stuff that we do, but it's uh it's 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 a great uh it's a great company and great team. You actually uh, wasn't but a few weeks ago I was at the Oracle Lab in uh, outside Chicago and they had a car that had been developed in partnership with a number of students and by the way right on the fin Luminar you know I'm not sure if oh, you're yeah. familiar, the uh autonomous uh IndyCar right so, yeah exactly exactly so uh know, that, that was cool that was super cool and I was like I took a picture of it I'm like I'm going to send that to Austin and his team and <laughs> that, then I never did but uh <laughs> You know that's that's what we do these days, right? We 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 snap every moment and take a picture of it because data, data, data. You know, need to capture every moment instead of living it, and then we never actually do the engaging stuff we intended to do with it. So you end up with like seven hundred thousand photos that you never look at again. That's what we do with technology. But let's talk more about practical technology because that's why I brought you here. Um, look, the autonomous space is going crazy. The uh, you know, semiconductor companies in tech. I want to talk about the blending, but I just want to start out first is, you know, you really had an idea from the onset about autonomy. That's the direction you're pushing. Not, not so much this iterative, but you're really pushing for that fully autonomous, the capabilities to get there. Let's talk about what comes first in terms of getting there. Um, you know, GFX, uh, autonomous robo taxis or shuttles, or are we going to see full autonomy in automotive, like passenger automobiles? Yeah, so I mean, I think the the place that is definitely going to be realized first is on the consumer vehicles, you know, for for passengers. And this is where it's it's uh, the distinction is is that for the robo taxi world inside of it, as well, there's been obviously a, a lot of hype around that historically. The challenge is is being able to have something that can uh, be have a system work end to end in these highly complex urban environments to be able to remove the driver altogether, pick up a passenger point A, drop it off on point B is actually an extremely challenging problem and, and very difficult to scale as well. So, you know, this is where, uh, while we do uh, and have worked with a lot of those companies, you know, the focus that we've really had is working with the traditional automakers to be able to see this technology realized into the real world at scale, you know, to be able to already start uh, seeing application, you know, today, like this decade, you know, a, a, in terms of the use case. And the use cases they are generally seeing for consumer vehicles uh, is for highway autonomy use cases, as well as next generation safety systems on vehicles. And this is where, you know, like I said, there's, there's on the order of 100 million vehicles shipped every year. Um, you know, it's nearly a $4 trillion a year industry. Uh, so it, it makes all the difference to be able to directly address that. And now we're starting to work with the majority of major automakers to really make all this happen. Yeah, I've, I've definitely seen it. And by the way, experienced it. I still uh, have you know, very, very good memories of our time at CES and some of the demonstrations that uh, we didn't run over that kid. Um, <laughs> by the way, for everybody out there, it was a dummy that we uh, were able to experience at CES where we were doing some comparisons of Luminar's technology uh, with other, uh, you know, autonomous driving technologies that are available in the market. I won't say it could be a certain Austin-based company not this Austin, Austin, Texas-based company that 
has a fairly large reputation, but uh, seeing the difference in the technology was palpable for me. It was significant to see how, you know, and again, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, you've got vision and you've got laser, uh, you know, and why would you not use all the types of radar, laser, you know, use them all. I, I, to me, it's so logical. And I know price is a bit of a challenge, but you've worked a lot on that. And, and I want to hear more about that. But another thing, though, that I just think is so interesting is that effectively cars and computers, cars and chips have become almost synonymous. And I think the pandemic brought this out. The supply chain has made it obvious to people. Um what do you think that all this is gone? Is it changing the relationships that automakers are having with compute and tech companies? I mean, what what is how is this new sort of realization shifting the landscape? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely uh, companies. Uh, there's really a requirement to be able to work much more closely with the automaker itself, and we we help pioneer this model by being one of the first new uh, tech companies in. in probably decade to be able to actually have a direct relationship with automakers to be able to deliver to them and to be able to actually work hand in hand toward collaboratively towards the solution. But, um, but I will say that for this is, is that it, every, everything you say totally, uh, I totally agree with in terms of the capabilities of what it takes to make this happen. You know, people, automakers have realized more and more just how meaningful uh, this kind of sensing system and technology and other stuff can make in terms of the safety of the vehicle and the autonomous capabilities and everything that's there. So, um, so yeah, it's continuing to improve, continuing to iterate and uh, working closely with them to be able to make that happen. It's, it's, uh, it is a step function change in capability that's there versus, you know, the incremental approaches that have had with, uh, from a, a safety standpoint, and this is really what it takes to be able to make that difference and make that happen. Yeah, it, 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 it's significant, and I'm watching sort of the the press drop, and it's you guys, of course, and several of your friends and competitors, allies across the semiconductor space, a bunch of them are here at the summit, you know, are announcing we've, uh, we've created this partnership with this uh, OEM and this partnership, and you're starting to see this real regular cadence of announcements coming out from automakers in partnership with chip makers, often best known for mobile phones or making laptops tech technologies and now they're, or, or gaming cards. And now they're, you know, the tech, and by the way, this isn't new. It's not like this just happened, but it's starting to become really visible. And especially I guess for us, cause we're in this market, but you guys have had a few announcements yourselves just recently. I saw uh, Mercedes, Volvo, um, I think Nissan, um, a number of yeah. different announcements. Talk about that. Why are these different vendors picking to partner with Luminar? And like I said, how do you coexist in this in this greater sort of community of tech and automotive coming together? Because sometimes it's you guys, sometimes it's you and others, right? It's not any one semiconductor company taking all of the the weight of the business on. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, and when it comes to the overall landscape, I think I think it's fair to say that yeah, there's no question there's been a lot of increased attention, you know, for this when you take a look at the um, as you said, like the Nvidia's and Qualcomm's and Mobileyes and all this other stuff getting heating up. You know, uh, auto tech is the cool new thing as well when it comes down to it of to be able to have a new frontier uh, to address to be able to actually expand the business because a lot of times people have uh, only reached. You can only do so much or reach certain heights, you know, without actually getting into this. It is a massive market um, from just an addressable market standpoint, and uh, it, it's clearly, as as folks have said, and I think, um, um, you know, I I, th I think like even just recently, we was just hearing the, um, you know, Jensen, the Nvidia CEO, just from a semiconductor standpoint, like speak to this that this market is as bigger or bigger than everything that we've had to date, you know, in the consumer side of things. So it, it does make a huge difference. And um, that, but but that said, it's also one of those that getting these, um, you know, critical partnerships early on is also very important to be able to establish uh, the working relationship. And, and this is one of those very high barrier to entry, but equivalently also very high barrier to exit type industries. And uh, working with, as you, as you mentioned, folks like the Volvos and Mercedes and Nissan to this world makes all the difference uh, toward, towards that success. So uh, we've, of course, also, you know, made sure that we can work successfully with the key platform partners along the way too, you know, with this. And um, yeah, it makes, uh, it makes a difference though. And uh, then of course, there's that on the passenger vehicle side. You know, we also have great work on the trucking side, for example, with like Daimler Truck and uh, as, as a lead partner, as a large producer of commercial vehicles and, you know, other um, like, a, you know, keep RoboTaxi partners like a Pony AI in China and, 
uh, and others. But um, but that said, it's it's uh, I'd say the focus is really from a volume standpoint on the, on the consumer vehicle side and what we're able to drive forward with that. I think is going to make a totally transformational difference over this decade. Yeah, and I think like what I what I was kind of getting at is there seems to be some different approaches to Austin. Like there's kind of some companies are sort of monolithic. They've got this single system approach and it's everything ADAS and everything. Um, other companies are kind of taking more of a bit of a building block approach where they're looking at the infotainment, telematics, policy, drive policy, um, ADAS systems, and they're kind of looking at them almost independently. Some of them are looking at multiple layers because of course, you know, Luminar is going all in on LIDAR, right? I mean, that's, that's, the technology that you're you're buying in on and in fact um you've i think you've actually pretty much publicly stated you think elon musk is just straight up getting it wrong um and so i can't help but want to ask that question because again i, I can definitely get more views by bringing this up but no in all <laughs> seriousness it's it's a it's it's a real probable uh question of interest you know because you know there are the tesla folks out there that will absolutely defend it to its death. They're com they're almost like the Apple cult, right? The people that you can never convince them no matter what. You could have a, a PC that can turn into a jet plane and they'd be like, no, I need a Mac, prefer my Mac. You know what I mean? Like, and I think there's a little bit of that kind of cult of Tesla that's that's coming out. But I think it, it you know, as some of these companies you're working with, you know, I definitely believe companies like VW and BMW with what they're building are going to build very competitive. And then of course you get the next generations, the Lucids and some of these companies that are building some pretty cool um, intelligent vehicles and, but Tesla is saying, no, no LIDAR. We don't think it's necessary. Uh, from what I've experienced in my demo, I have a hard time agreeing with that. There's a few cars that have smashed into some things that also seem to disagree with that. Why are you so passionate that they can't get it right without LIDAR? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really just a question of what you're trying to build. And, and I would say that there's, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with not using the LIDAR, right? Like people have, people have been doing this for the better part of a decade with the, like, there's great companies like Mobileye out there, for example, that supply these camera based systems there. And, uh, you know, effectively what Tesla did is they ended up, you know, replicating a version of what they had previously with Mobileye, um, you know, and continue to advance that with better, you know, assistive driving systems and, and, and technologies. The fundamental distinction here though, isn't, is is less about what the capability is more just about the marketing side of things of calling an assist like a, a basic level two assisted driving system full self-driving i think that's the part that really rubs everyone in the industry uh the wrong way just because it's not true um but you know uh, apart from that i i mean the reality is is that it, it, like it's great to have that base level capability but the point is is a is that um and you don't need lidar to do that just for sake of clarity but but obviously uh, you know, we the, the game has completely changed, and, and, and in part because of us as, as well, of what we've really driven it. You know, you don't have to have some, it's not a $75,000, you know, spinning bucket on a roof anymore, you know, when it when it comes down to when they originally made a decision to just implement a camera-based system that was that was there. Um, the whole point is, is that this is something that you can actually have in your car for $1,000 or $500 or something to that effect. Uh, that they can actually dramatically improve the safety of the vehicle and actually be able to enable you to achieve autonomy. And, um, you know, considering the folks like that are charging, uh, you know, 12, what, like $12,000 now for, uh, you know, these feature sets. I mean, I think uh, if, it, if it actually makes it achievable and uh, increases the safety 10x, uh, it seems to make a lot of sense. So now the reality is, of course, is that um, the, the, the focus for us is really on the, you know, higher volume or mainstream automakers that are there that are established. You know, we get paid the same amount. Honestly, whether regardless of whatever the engine type is of the vehicle, um, you know, that's there. So having, having that be established is great. Um, and that's why we're working with the majority of, of the major automakers. So, like I said, it's all about the level of capability. It's all about what you want. And, and, it, and the whole point of why all these automakers are so excited to use Luminar is to take the capabilities to the next level. And that's where people are leapfrogging Tesla at this point. You know, you take a look at the Volvos and the Mercedes and, and, and other folks and even Nissans of this world. And, uh, you know, Tesla's ultimately going to have to find a way to be able to catch up uh, to, it, with, to be able to get to that next level of safety uh, for, for the vehicles. And that's what we showed. You know, I mean, it, was, it's, it wasn't just about that. It's, it's not a Tesla problem. It's an industry problem, you know, of, of the existing uh, challenges that are there with the safety of vehicles. Vehicles still get in accidents all the time. You know, it's the number one cause of death between, you know, ages one and 44 in, in many places. And, and this is the whole problem that's directly solvable by this. And yet uh, we haven't seen 
any significant improvements in vehicle fatalities and other ma major iterations in, in you know that are step functions the better part of a couple of decades and this is the time to change that this is the you know i, I mean you've heard the term like volvo calling it the 21st century seatbelt, and that's what it's all about now. yeah well you know if i can add though to me it seems like there is a responsibility of automakers and policymakers to enforce you know we've always lagged in this stuff you know it's kind of like that old i don't you know i didn't wear a seatbelt when i was a kid they weren't required so i'm not going to wear one now people have used it with the whole mask debate and the whole idea of kind of well when you get new information that makes something clearly a better way to care for people in human life i mean think of all the not to get too political but all the human life debates we have period and it's like what about saving you know 15 year olds and 30 year olds and 45 year olds um from dying by adding a, you know a level of intelligence that's available now off the shelf that could avoid accidents proactively um so yeah. you know not to get you know you know not to get too on my high horse here but uh, to me, it's almost crazy that the legal and policy lags so much when there's technology that is available right now. So, you know, I can understand that you don't want to subsidize my gaming habit or you don't want to subsidize the fact that I might want a new iPhone every six months. But what about forcing or enforcing or creating policies that said, hey, there is better technology that could keep. Absolutely. Yeah, 100 well, percent. Exactly. You know? and, and I think to your whole point, it's not even about. um yeah, and as you said, not to politicize it, but if you actually make that comparison, I mean, it, like you take a look at like the amount of fatalities that happened from like, you know, the global pandemic and COVID and everything in 2020. And it's like in it, it's actually um, I think when they add it up, uh, you know, you end up actually having more global vehicle deaths, you know, that are related to car accidents than there are from that. So it's the same. I mean, the same kind of magnitude of problem. But the thing is, it's just it's become an accepted part of reality that that's just the way it is and yeah. there's not much you can you can do it it's just a fact of life and it happens every single yeah. year it's, it's just, this is this is the crazy part so yeah. totally solvable um you know and here's the thing is that it's it's it, it's a fundamental step function and capability that will ultimately also be driven by by regulation as well it's not i mean it's going to be driven of course by you know consumer and oem interest in terms of you know having much safer vehicles and having autonomous capabilities but obviously from a regulatory standpoint for next generation safety standards and everything, it's going to be important. So, I mean, it's coming for everyone ultimately. <laughs> uh, even if you don't like the concept of a seatbelt, it's gonna it'll it'll be there at the end of the day in yeah. your car. And well, I think that's that that's important. It's same same kind of principle for this. The reality is, of course, it can make a huge difference. And and obviously, uh, it, it, there, there's no uh, uh, the relative value is is immense. Having experienced the difference, it's 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 legitimate and it's visible and it's clear. But like I said, I do think it's going to have to be somewhat driven by policy, which unfortunately does tend to lag. And so often um, it's unfortunate because it could be making a real difference in this moment, probably in the time that we've spent having this conversation probably could save a life right now. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to get off my my uh, my bandwagon for a minute here and just say, you know, this advancement is really important. It's very interesting you know, appreciate the innovation, uh, the fact that, you know, you're sticking to it. Congratulations on the new, uh, you know, the new partnerships that have been announced. I'm hoping that you guys, alongside many of the companies here at this event that are uh, involved in taking the automotive industry forward in partnership, you know, I hope you solve the problems. I hope you, you know, bring it to the world at scale. And I hope that people realize that it's a small price to pay to, to protect lives and of course, make our roads safer. And, and by the way, get us places faster because all those things, you know, are interdependent. So Austin Russell, you know, thanks so much for joining us at the six, five summit enlightening conversation. As always, we never play it safe. Do we? No, we don't. And by what, one last thing, by the way, when you say a small price to pay that price will actually go. Actually, when you take a look at a total cost of ownership perspective for all of this, when you take it from an insurance standpoint, because it turns out, you know, safety uh, accidents are expensive. Better safety saves actually a lot of money if it has a material impact there. So even an incremental impact in vehicle accidents 
that reduces the total cost of ownership to a point of where the technology ends up paying for itself multiple times over. So there's really like a strong business case in, in every aspect of, of being able to have this. I don't, actually don't even think it's going to take the regulators to push this. This is it's really going to be driven by the consumer, by the automakers, by everything that to be able to make a difference here. And then uh, ultimately, I, I, what. It, it'll be, I think, a requirement in consumers' minds whether or not, it, uh, uh, regardless of the timeline, it becomes a legal requirement. But no, this is uh, it's it's a, it's a good perspective. But th no, this has been fun, and thanks for uh, thanks for hosting on everything. This is uh, it's great to catch up. Austin Russell says, "Data and logic will prevail. We shall see." But thanks for joining <laughs> me at the Six Five Summit this year, Austin. Can't wait to chat again soon.